everybody, it's Mrs. Shalathan Humphrey uh, here for the next part of our novel study, The Fantastic Frame. I'm going to be starting where we left off. Luna and Tiger set the clock on the frame to four o'clock and that put them into like this magic hour that they magically figured out and unknowingly they figured out and they got sucked into the fantastic frame and there's a storm going on the painting is a tiger in a tropical storm and so they get sucked into the painting and they're going to go try to find Viola Dot's uh, son David um, who got sucked into the painting years ago and Viola Dots to remind you as an older woman um, who lost her son to a painting and in the place of her son um, the painting spit out a orange pig that talks which is their butler chives okay so this is kind of where we are right now so they've just been sucked into the painting and we leave off and Tiger says that he hears Tiger Brooks is the main character. He is the narrator of the story and he hears a tiger roar. It just so happens that Tiger Brooks and the painting both have the word tiger in them. So that's where we are. And remember, Tiger is our narrator. First person, he says I and he is speaking. OK, so chapter five. We landed with a thud. Darkness was all around me. Above me, I saw thousands of stairs climbing steeply up to nowhere. In front of me, I could barely make out what looks like a dark blue black leaves. The ground fe felt wet and soggy beneath me. Tiger, where are we? Luna asked. I'm not sure, I answered, but there's only one way to find out. I tucked my helicopter into the pocket of my shorts so I could put both arms in front of me. The air was hot. Heavy silver raindrops fell all around us. As we took a few steps forward, the light grew bright enough for us to see that we were in the middle of a jungle. Tall trees with vines wrapped around their trunks surrounded us on all sides. And here they are in the jungle. It's the jungle in the painting, Luna said. It's exactly the same. Do you think we're actually inside it, I asked? Luna didn't answer. She just shivered with fear. That said it all. See those red flowers over there, she said. They were in the painting next to the tiger. The tiger. If we were truly in the painting, there would be a tiger. Where was he? A sudden bolt of lightning flashed across the sky and lit up the face of the tiger. He was crouched behind a group of ferns at exactly the same spot where he was in the painting. His yellow eyes were glowing. His mouth was open and he looked hungry. And this is the tiger in Henry Rousseau's uh, painting, Henri Rousseau's painting, that is a real painting called A Tiger in a Tropical Storm, and this is what he looks like. Hmm. Is he real? Luna said. The tiger sniffed the air. His yellow eyes followed even the slightest movement. Oh yeah, he's real all right, I whispered. We need to get out of here now. I grabbed Luna's hand and we took off running. The jungle was thick with trees and vines and ferns and flowers. The wind blew the rain in our faces. I had no idea where we were going. I glanced behind. The tiger was following us across the jungle floor, breathing hard and showing his sharp teeth. One thing is for sure, I know for sure, you can't outrun a tiger. They can run up to 35 miles per hour. If we were going to escape him, we had to think of something else and fast. Luna knew that too. Over there, she called out, pointing to the tall tree. Let's climb to the top. No good, I panted. I could barely talk because I was running so fast. Tigers are cats. They can climb trees. 
Up ahead, we saw a patch of waist-high, thick grass. We ducked behind it to catch our breath. There was no sound for a moment. There was no sound except the plop of the raindrops hitting the soggy ground. I think he's gone, whispered Luna, peering out from behind the tangle of tall grasses. Maybe we lost him. A large striped paw suddenly stopped, shot through the thicket. Its long claws swiped the air right past our faces. No! I screamed. Without a word, Luna grabbed my hand and we bolted out of the grass, deeper into the dark jungle. I didn't dare look behind me. I knew the tiger was there. He was so close, I could hear him breathing. I didn't want to imagine his big black nostrils going in and out with each breath. Look! A river! Luna cried. I can see it beyond the trees. We can make it there. Just put your head down and run, I said. Don't worry about me, she called. I can run like the wind. And she did, her feathered hair, fl feathered hat flying in the air. And the tiger was still close behind us when we reached the banks of the river. Luna and I jumped into the water without a second thought. There could have been a million crocodiles in there, but we didn't care. We just wanted to escape the jaws of the tiger. When he saw us in that river, he let out an angry roar. I started to shake, not from the cold, but just from being scared. So... They jump in a river to get away from the tiger. Oh my goodness. It's okay, Luna whispered to me. We're safe, at least for now. Not true. The tiger waded into the river and started paddling his way towards us. I didn't know they could swim. I cried. What do we do now? Swim faster, a voice called out. Could have thought of that, I said to Luna. Thought of what? I didn't say anything. You didn't just tell me to swim faster? No? I looked around to see whose voice I heard heard, but I didn't see anyone. Was that voice coming from the treetops? Or was it from coming under the water? Or was I imagining it? I couldn't tell. Find the cave, the voice said. I turned to Luna to see if she had heard it too, but she was already swimming towards the other side. I put my head into the water and took off after her. With that tiger closing in on us, we had no choice. We had to swim for our lives. Chapter six. Dun, dun, dun. Luna and I never stopped to take a breath. We swam frantically towards the opposite bank. When we got to shore, we crawled out into the thick mud. I scanned the area in front of us. All I saw was a grove of trees. There was nothing that looked like a cave. We can't stay here looking around, Luna said. We have to move on. I could see that the tiger was splashing in the river, getting dangerously near the bank of the river. Suddenly, something caught my eye. It was running through the trees ahead of us. It went by too fast for me to see what it was. All I could see that it was hairy and running on two feet. Do you think it's a gorilla? Luna asked. Oh, too small, I said. A chimpanzee? I shook my head. Too big. Well, I say we follow it, she said. Maybe it knows something we don't. We took off after the creature. Somewhere in the grove of trees, we lost sight of it. We kept going anyway. On the other side of the grove, we hit a wall of rocks with giant boulders in front. There was no sign of the creature. I examined the rocks quickly. Over there, I said, pointing to a narrow, low opening between two boulders. Maybe that's the mouth of the cave. We ran to the opening. I was really small. Luna dropped to the ground, crawling on her hands and knees. She squeezed her head and shoulders through the boulder into the tight space. It's a cave, she called out, her legs disappearing from my side sight. Follow me inside, tiger. Can't fit in there. No way. Uh, neither can the tiger, she said. You have to try. I turned around to check on the tiger. He was no more than 10 feet away. He was crouched on his hind legs. His claws extended all the way out. I knew that gesture is what cow cats do right before they're about to pounce on a mouse. The tiger was getting ready to attack. With my heart beating fast, I dove for the opening of the cave. My heart my head went in fine, and I was even able to wedge my shoulders through, but my metal got stuck. 
I sucked in my stomach wishing I hadn't had that tuna melt for lunch. I kicked my feet and pushed against the ground, but my body wasn't going anywhere. I thought I felt the tiger's hot breath on my legs. Pull my arms, I called to Luna. I'm trying, she said. I'm just not strong enough. Here she's pulling him. Oh no. I'm trying, she said. I'm just not strong enough. Suddenly, I felt another pair of hands grab me, pulling with such force, I thought my arms might pop out of their sockets. One pull, two pulls. On the third pull, my middle scraped through the opening. In one smooth motion, the rest of my body followed. I was inside the cave, looking into the eyes of a hairy creature. Chapter 7. It wasn't a creature. It was a human, a teenage boy, kneeling on the ground next to Luna. He was very skinny with brown curly hair that was so long it shot out in every direction. He was dirty from head to toe. His shirt and pants were so ripped up I could barely tell that they were once clothes. He had patched up the holes with leaves and mud and animal fur. Who are you? I demanded. There's Tiger and Luna and then the mystery boy. Well, that's not very friendly, he answered. You might say thank you. If it weren't for me, you'd be that Tiger's dinner by now. Thank you for saving Tiger's life, Luna said to him. Tiger, he laughed. <laughs> what kind of name is that? Uh, my real name is Tyler, I explained, although I didn't much like him laughing at my name. Tiger's a nickname. I have a nickname, too. My parents used to call me D.D. It's my initials. Luna and I exchanged shock looks. D.D., she asked slowly, as in David Dots? That was the boy's turn to look shocked. How do you know my name? He asked. Your mother told us. My mother? How do you know her? We live right next door to her in Los Angeles, I said. Impossible, David answered. There's no house next door to her, just empty lots on both sides. I've lived in my house since I was born, Luna said, so it's been there for at least 10 years. I can tell you that. David looked confused, but I was beginning to understand what was going on. I think a lot has changed in the 50 years since you disappeared, I told him. Your mother says that's how long you've been gone. David got a faraway look in his eyes. I remember the day, he said. My mother was making me practice on the piano. I always wanted to play the drums, but she insisted on I learn piano. I remember the piano was next to that new frame that my parents had just bought. Yeah, I said, the fantastic frame with the rabbits and owls and grapes. And don't forget the weird gold clock with the birds, Luna said. You mean the broken clock with the birds? I asked, not to brag or anything about it, but I fixed it. It worked fine back then, David said. I remember it was exactly four o'clock when all the crazy stuff happened in the painting. Wow, Luna said, you have a really great memory to remember the exact time. You don't forget a thing like that. David told her. It's not every day that you get swallowed by a painting. The moment David said those words, it hit me. The hour of power. Could the frame's hour of power be from four o'clock until five o'clock? That would make sense. Maybe that's why the clock started at four and the hands stopped at five. Of course, that was the magical hour, the hour of power. My mind was racing, but David was still way back in the past. The next thing I knew, he was telling Luna. I was being tossed around in the storm. Then I flew through the window of some ancient castle. I must have passed out after that because I had a dream about a fat orange pig wearing a bow tie. I had a feeling chives wouldn't like being called fat. After all, pigs are supposed to be a little pudgy. You got sucked into your mother's painting, Luna explained to David. She's been looking for you ever since, doing one painting after another. We saw them. There was one with yellow haystacks. David smiled like he was remembering a happy memory from a long ago. Yes, I was there, he said. Golden haystacks in the French countryside. I stayed there from morning to sunset. It was so peaceful. 
And then there was another painting of a navy blue sky with wild looking stars, I said. I was there too, he remembered. It was a field of dark twisted trees and the moon was such a bright yellow. He got up and started to pace around the cave. I've been to hundreds of places since then, he said. Italian villages, castles in Spain, a desert filled with melting clocks. Don't tell my mother. But I even spent some time with a lady who came out of a clamshell. Oh, the one in the clamshell, I said, we saw. But if I've gone, been gone for 50 years living in paintings, why haven't I gotten any older, he wondered. Viola said that people in paintings don't change, Luna said. She said art is ageless. David pushed his wild hair from his forehead. I could see this was a lot for him to take and think about. At last he said, this means you two are from the future. Yep, I said, we live in the 21st century. Maybe you can come back with us. That is, if we can ever get back. David looked at me suspiciously. What if you've come here to trick me, he asked. Do you have any proof that what you're saying is true? I didn't blame him for doubting us. It's not every day that two kids fly through a painting into a jungle. We can tell you all about the world that we live in, Luna said. It has computers and mobile phones and electric cars and 3D movies. I saw this really scary one last week about a three-eyed monster. Luna, I interrupted. I think he gets the point. Those things aren't proof, David said. You could have read about that stuff in science fiction stories. Then it occurred to me. I did have proof. Right there in my soggy pocket, I reached in, pulled out my helicopter, and set it on the floor of the cave. That doesn't look like any helicopter I've seen, David said. It's an Apache longbow, Luna told him. That thing on the top by the rotors is a radar pod. Wow, that was a surprise. Girls who collect bird feathers don't usually know about helicopter radio radar technology. How did you know that? I asked Luna. My dad's in the army, she explained. He's a helicopter pilot overseas. David had moved closer and was inspecting the helicopter. Watch this, I told him. I bet you never had a remote control radio transmitter for your toys. I took out the remote out of my pocket. It had gotten pretty soggy in the river, so I hoped it still worked. I pushed up on the throttle. The blades started to twirl, slowly at first, and then they sped up. The helicopter lifted off. I moved it forward and back, up and down, and in a complete circle, and then I let it hover right in front of David. I could see amazement on his face. The whirring sound of the rotors echoed loudly in the cave. Uh-oh, tiger. Look behind you, Luna whispered. I don't think our striped friend likes the noise. I heard a growl and turned around to face the small, uh, face the mouth of the cave. The small opening was filled with the tiger's paw. He was digging at the ground, trying to get a grip underneath the boulder. Tigers are strong. But are they strong enough to shove love large rocks aside to get their prey? I didn't know the answer. All I knew is that we were trapped inside a cave with a hungry tiger trying to get, trying to get in. It was no longer a safe place for us. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Okay, so the tiger's trying to get into the cave. They just met David, who got lost in the painting 50 years ago, and they're trying to show him that they're um, from the future, and they have remote control helicopters and all this stuff from the future, and um, he has been in so many different paintings, but they've never gotten the same, the clock to work until now for 50 years. So it's been impossible for David to get out. So that's kind of where they are. And the tiger is about to come in to the cave. We don't know. We'll have to find out and see how that goes. Um, so tune in tomorrow and um, the next time and like and subscribe in, down below. And um, we'll continue our story. Thanks so much. See y'all later. Bye.